All right, what's up, Giga Gamers? Welcome to the Strat Chat. We've got something special for you today. Shout out to Lolly Sports and Skillcap for putting together an awesome video. It's totally worth watching. We talk about it a lot on the channel, the concept of pressure and the idea of asking questions. And when you ask a question, do they come up with the right answer? And if they don't, how do you punish? And the idea is that you ask a lot of questions over and over. And what this does is it creates pressure for your opponents and it makes them potentially fumble. And if you're ready or more ready than they are, then it gives you multiple chances to win. So without further ado, let's check out the video. I hope you guys enjoy it. X, after an incredibly successful year with his team, was crowned the LEC's MVP. Congrats For this to Mickey X, you deserved it. Esports collaboration, we really wanted to highlight what makes Mickey so darn good. Obviously, Mickey is insane at everything he does, his engagements are on point, G2 is always winning on vision, plus his champion pool is massive, making drafting a pain versus G2. You say you see massive, but look at what these all have in common, right? Big body supports. It's important that your team plays a similar identity over and over and over, right? When you do this, it allows you to grow within your role and your team can trust. If you suddenly pop a, let's go out of left field and put Zyra over here or Janna over here, and you're just like mage support, enchanter support, and then how does it affect what we're trying to do early? You can see that there's a very negative effect on the rest of the team because it changes the way that your team dynamic is going when you hold this one position steady it means that your entire team can grow around you and you'll notice that hansama tends to pair with it very aggressive laners like draven like Callista. that is his strength now together you compare those things instead of being two pieces it's like the team gets closer and closer to forming this fist when instead of five fingers you make one fist this is obviously going to hurt more than this if you are going to fight them so very important to keep a steady steady uh champion pool G2. But what we really want to highlight is something unique to him, something we'll coin his in-your-face playstyle. To put it simply, he's just really aggressive in his positioning compared to other supports. And you'll notice most people that when you're playing and climbing, climbing in different levels, the biggest thing is they understand how much pressure they can put on you and they push it closer and closer to the limit, right? That's the biggest thing about climbing, knowing those limits, what can you do, and you have to limit us to find it out. It seems like he knows his limits perfectly and knows exactly what he can get away with in terms of positioning and makes opponents aware of that constantly. This can have a wide nice variety of advantages. Like just now, he clearly wasted quite a bit of the enemy team's time. All right, so it's wasting time, right? You see what their answer. This is an example of Mad Lions coming up with a bad answer. They come up, they say, hey, I think I've got Braum. Now, he's got allies that are nearby. LeBlanc here, another person going to, to the bottom lane. If the wrong number of people show up, or if they get more vision of people near the top lane, then he can turn this into a fight. He can say, I will bait out with my chunky stats. I play the same kind of champions that all have 45 base armor. They're not going to take any damage early in the game because you guys don't have your mythic items completed. Uh, or even if you do, that's all you have. And so you're not really that big of a threat. I can stand up here, not really scared of dying because of my champion's kit. And if you bring too many people i run and now too many people have converged my team can now put pressure elsewhere or if you don't bring enough people my team will come and fight time by just posturing aggressively in the river watching g2's games you'll notice just how often mickey is in melee range of his opponents just messing with them this puts so much pressure on his opponents and they often crack under that pressure wasting time cooldowns or better yet Mickey will often single-handedly carry team fights on his own with this playstyle. But... This fight is exceptional right here. His team is off screen up on the top. They're actually making a play for Jax on the left side. But by showing up here, he is effectively peeling three different champions right now. He's also taking the enemy team com comms and saying, oh, let's, we, we can catch this guy. And no, we're not. You're not going to catch this fat Nautilus. He's got flash up. He can go over this wall. He can take all of your threats and just say no we'll we'll, uh, we'll deal with it later and if you want to chase me with three you're going to chase me into my team and Jax will be zoned out or if you continue to chase me this way then my team can collapse on Jax. there's not many good answers right here this is such fantastic positioning but we'll get to that for now let's start things off in the laning phase and show you right, how he uses his early. in your face play style in lane in this game mickey is playing brom with Isaiah versus the mad lions bot lane of nyla and nautilus 
It's fair to say that this is a scary matchup. The enemy duo is going to constantly look to play incredibly aggressive, do score kills, or get CS advantages. Mickey and Hans play quite passively knowing that they're on the back foot of this matchup early on until this moment. As the fourth wave comes in, it's important to understand what the Mad Lions bot lane probably wants to do. They've got a big wave stacking up, so what they're likely going to do is fast crash this wave so that a bounce... All right, so here's your test. Hashtag strat check. This will be the secret call out for the for the video what would you do what what's your game plan as blue team here is it exactly this with the with the push in the crash in rebound out uh and if you're red team how would you answer it think about that answer make, you can pause the video put it in in the comments and we'll make sure to answer them back begins towards their side of the lane during that time they recall buy items and come back to play on the wave that's pushing into them with their aggressive combo and an item advantage they can probably hold the freeze and put mickey and hans in a terrible position so what does mickey do they're down a level this early in the game they're at a massive wave disadvantage and he has no vision in this brush but he just begins walking at them face checks the brush and starts whacking nautilus it's such a ridiculous play that the mad lion's bot lane doesn't even know how to process it they hold their spells because they're afraid a gank is probably coming why else would he just do randomly walk up like that queue. everyone disengages the mad lines crash the wave and back off okay let's address a couple things for starters if you try to pull that off in your own games nyla and nautilus would more than likely just go in and kill you solo queue players well all right let's talk about killing for example if they're putting damage on the support your carry is going to run amok and your carry hitting their carry while their two are hitting you especially when you have a tanky champion is always a better situation for a fight and specifically when you're a champion like braum you can say all right i can put a stun proc on you to mitigate your damage and deal you more and i either have my e wall to stop some of your incoming damage or I have the ability to boost armor for the fight jumping back and kiting back so in reality this is much letter much less of a risk than the video is suggesting rarely respect the threat of gangs so they would just mindlessly go on you and you die secondly why did Mickey even risk his life the Mad Lions bot lane still crashed the wave and got to recall like we discussed he just risked giving over a free can you answer that question why why did he do it what's the big gain out of causing this little delay pressuring them and seeing if they come up with the right answer right think about it for a moment you're buying some time you're making their recall further further in the future right they're gonna have to wait a little bit longer to get the push your wave is a little bit in better situation that's going to help also they seem to still think that your jungler might be nearby so they might not just recall right here in shadow the, the way that they could they might actually run all the way further back thinking why was braum being that aggressive is their jungler here we know the jungler started topside is the jungler actually coming hold on we need to back up he killed for seemingly no reason what gives well, that brings us to this guide's special skill capped tip. This is very important. As we discussed, after a crash, a wave will begin bouncing back to the other side of the lane. Usually during the early game, players will base to get an item advantage and come back to freeze the wave and build the lead that way. But what's important is how much time you're giving the opponent to get back and do that. Do you see how right after the crash, G2's wave is already coming into the lane? You see how Hilly's rotating it also? He wasted a few... Worth noting that Hilly's on a roam timer, right? The AD carry can recall, but there's not much for the support to do so he's gonna go wander off but they also have vision of it to see that that's what he's doing seconds of their time where they didn't focus on pushing ideally the mad lions would have crashed while g2's incoming wave was still further back basically they lost about five seconds or so of time to recall and get back to lane let's take a look at the result by the time nyla is back in lane hansa has already built up such a massive wave. can you see how aggressive they're being right here the fact that they went and got extra Extra time on the minions, they stacked up this wave. Now they've got all the minions at their back. They can play aggressively. Not only that, but Hansama has the level, which makes up for not having the recall, right? So this recall that comes back with a with a little crash like that tends to be about 450, 500 gold. And you're talking about getting an extra longsword and maybe refillable potion. But that's nothing compared to a level. When you have the level, the 100 e extra HP, that already accounts for the refillable potion. You've gained three or four AD, which accounts for some of the longsword. Plus you've got attack speed, you've got all these stats and an extra spell. So you are still stronger in this moment and it's very important that you use this window. It's not just about the wave, it's also about the level and using the stacks. Now there's a couple things that we can talk about with the experience. Hilly went for a roam timer and came back, totally fine. Karzi comes back, they catch the wave and they're gonna have options. This is gonna rebound, they'll be able to push. But Hans Sama, you notice how these experiences are slightly different. This is something that you do in pro. 
if you are a support, you step away from the lane for a moment. It does two things. One is it puts pressure on the idea that you might be roaming. But secondly, if you share all of your experience, you actually can end up on some waves at that threshold where you're at basically 3.9 level 3.9 if you step away for a moment and you give solo experience to your carry they bump up a level you're still the same it's fine you're going to hit the break points at the same time roughly but more importantly han sama is already level four can flex this advantage whereas if you don't do this then you're both going to be level 3.99 and you're sitting there like hmm, i can't quite punish because we're still level three and there's no minions to hit level four off of we might actually be in trouble to a all in that there's no way she can stop him from crashing. But imagine if she was in lane just five seconds earlier. This is what the wave looked like. With her item and health lead, she could easily contest this and keep the wave frozen. And specifically still level three. Guaranteeing that she gets a lead. Instead, thanks to Mickey's stalling, Hans gets to crash the wave and keep this volatile lane safe and stable. You can earn a lot of lane advantages or saves like that one through aggressive positioning like we just saw from Mickey. But like we mentioned earlier, how do you do that without just dying for free every time? What we recommend you do during the laning phase is something known as reaction checks. What you want to do is track your own jungler every now and then. Check whether they're showing on the map or if they're hidden in the fog of war. Then you want to do some small tests with your positioning to see how your opponents react to your body language while well, they don't have info on your jungler all right so this is a little bit of a complicated thing to learn awareness is one of the skills that you have to learn and the easiest thing is to go into practice tool and give yourself a mundane task like clearing the jungle or getting perfect cs give yourself a mundane task with no opponents but constantly in between every move click look up look up take take a, a note of your surroundings it's very easy to tunnel vision on the one small thing that you're looking at but if you have a chance to do make an action then look up check the map if you watch these pro games their eyes are darting darting constantly over to their mini map whereabouts for example if there's a cannon minion about to die walk up aggressively and see how they react do they back off from it or this is firmly fantastic. Hold their ground? you can tell a lot about a player's tendency from two to three reaction checks per lane if you notice that you're versus someone who always respects the threat of you walking up, then you can use this to look for small advantages. Deny a minion, clear a ward, or even delay a crash like we saw from Mickey. Or if you're versus a player who never backs off from your posturing, then you know that you don't have to work that hard to bait them when your jungler is actually there. You'll know for sure that if you walk up, that they'll likely just fight you, making baiting ganks that much easier. Which brings... Now, I want to talk about for a moment. Yes, baiting these things and looking out and getting this extra information, always good. But also keep in mind that your opponent, especially in pro we're talking about, they're going to learn, right? So this was an idea for, for solo queue about what you're going to react. It matters a little bit in pro too. You can get information. How confident is this player that his jungler is nearby? Is he willing to take this fight? Because they're not going to make those mistakes. They're not going to like make a blunder. If you're playing aggressively and they don't have teammates, Nine times out of ten, they will back off. Sometimes it's correct for them to actually go ba forward back at you and make you wonder about what's going on, right? And they can play that that mind game going in. Brings us back to this moment. Same thing here. Through years of playing pro, Mickey knows that he's versus a competent player who actually respects ganks. He also knows that they respect his own skill. So when he makes a psychopathic play like this one, he's confident that they'll hesitate to go in and likely back off, giving him small leads during lane. Of course, this was not as big of a risk as as the narrator's talking about, right? Braum has tools to get away from this situation and including Flash, if the enemy team is willing to spend the extra five seconds to try to consolidate this kill, they might actually ruin their entire lane phase for it. We're not highlighting Mickey's crazy positioning just because it gives him small laning advantages. Let's now take a look at how his posturing can single-handedly win teamfights for G2 in the later stages of a game. In this game, G2 animation. and BDS are having a pretty close match. The gold is dead even. It's a super tense game that could be decided at any moment. I'd love to see the minimap, but take take note of the position of the champions and their control wards. You see how they have a very solid line right here? Mickey is confident with this ward, this ward. No one's been in this area. They have mid push. Look at this control ward in the middle of the map and the one forward in the lane. Like, look at this net. No one is coming into this area, so you can play with extreme confidence. And Yike knows that if anyone does show up, that he's probably can be very solid for a flank. This also becomes a mini objective, a little bait for the enemy team to try to go for. And you're creating all of this space for Caps to push out. To try and gain an edge, G2 uses their mid priority to rotate towards top to potentially catch out Jax. While they go through the river, Mickey goes off on his own through the jungle instead. He paces back and forth, then the second... This is fantastic, right? Think about it for a second. What is he getting out of this? 
Now, it's worth seeing what which cooldowns he has. He has everything. He's got Flash, he's got his Summoners. So when he's stepping up, he's actually trying to advance his line, and he's the one doing it first because he's a ta tanky uh, Nautilus, right? You have Caps that's already pushed the wave. It looks like it's Orianna. So also, enemy team just really never wants to even touch the Nautilus because they have to be careful of an Orianna ball plus a shockwave coming up for a, a chain wombo. And Nautilus, if he ever gets the uh, subterranean divide, whatever it's called, gets a big stun, cues into the middle of them, it's a perfect ball, uh, ball delivery situation. So they need to be very careful about it. And this is the battle for Pryo, right? Enemy team should be here fighting for this wave so that they have more vision, they can see more of the rotations. That he sees Zary in and because Crowny's late, he walks. because she was taking Krugs, all right, or not Krugs, Raptors, Taking Raptors, yes, it's great. You'd like to get the extra resource, but look at how much it's going to cost them. Further in, as he does, look at this nonsensical play he makes. He uses his hook on Maokai and just starts brawling with him. This is ridiculous. He used his main escape tool aggressively while he's alone. Also, this is late in the game, so it's got a short cooldown. So no one is even coming his way since all of G2 is headed towards Jax. It's a play that seems really bad in the moment. Anyway, he sees Tristana come out of Fog of War, then immediately kites away since she's an actual damage threat. Rakan comes out as well, and the second he sees the knockup coming, Mickey instantly flashes over the wall. It may seem like he's just trolling and wasting his flash air, but in reality... Count, count the cooldowns that we've already seen, right? You have EW, you have QE, there's at least W from Maokai, it might have also been a Q that we see right here. He's making things very awkward for BDS. Their Jax is being collapsed on, but Mickey is right there. He's just in their face and you can't simply ignore it. Think about it. League is a game where every second, even milliseconds matter. In a chaotic moment, if you position in a way that forces your opponents to have to make a tough choice, they are likely to crumble under the pressure. There's five- And this, this is the core concept, right? Asking questions. And this is why we gave caps, or why we blew him up so much. Like he's showing on Nico completely changed the world's metagame because up until he played Nico, everyone thought Nico could do X, Y, and Z. And Caps, by constantly asking questions, by never dropping the disguise, always being a minion or a teammate or being this, always putting the, the clone forward, always threatening with Rocket Belt, just always posturing makes the opponent's mental stack go berserk, right? You're just stacking on top. You, you're overloading their ability to process what might actually be happening by constantly asking these questions. And when you do, you're likely and more likely and more likely to get bad responses that you can punish. So as long as your team's communication is good, this is an optimal strategy that you need to be willing to enforce. As teams get better at this, I'm glad that this video is coming out, but our teams do not do this well. As they improve, then you're gonna get into this, but I know that they know sort of battle and you can go back and forth with it. But until we reach that level, this is 100% exploitable where you can use this and put your opponents under the pressure cooker, force them to make bad decisions. Faker does it to Chovy all the time. Five players on the enemy team. They all have to know what the correct choice is, and then they all have to make that correct choice. If one or two of them fall for the bait of your posturing, the enemy team might instantly collapse Fantastic. and lose a If you don't think it'll work in- Hopefully you guys caught that right here. You see this? Like if they, they these are the decisions. If, they, if they're not all on the same page, but your team is on the same page and you just know your job very well, our team is trying to kill Jax. Make no mistake about it. I'm here getting forward vision, peeling for the potential flank and ready to escape very quickly, right? You see that he did not wait. You see if they have different answers, then suddenly the Jax becomes exploited. Of them fall for the bait of your posturing, the enemy team might instantly collapse and lose a fight. If you don't think it'll work in solo queue, then watch what it does to this perfect. I just want to highlight for a moment right team here, this is Zeri. And lose a fight. If you this don't is something that's very common. See how she's coming over here? She gave up her mid prio, right? And in part of it, it's because they're behind in this game. But Crowny's saying, I want to maximize every moment for gold that I can get in the game. When you get to the end game, the difference in gold of a camp or of a wave or of a cannon is inconsequential. It does not matter relative to tempo and pressure. When you're using your tempo to actually put more pressure on your opponent, they might crumble and make big game ending mistakes. Congratulations, you just picked up the Raptor camp. You got what? 67 gold or something and now you're coming back to fight this wave that's already on your side they've already moved their vision they're already on the move now you're late to the play and your 100 golden experience that you got for taking a camp your teammates have to pay for it now 
people work in solo queue, then watch what it does to this professional team on voice cons. Going back to this moment, Mickey instantly flashes Rakan's W, so he stays nearly at full HP. He's wasted a bit of time and cooldowns already, but let's reassess the fight. The rest of G2 is still rotating towards the top lane kill. He really doesn't want BDS to go and help Jax get out alive. So look at what he does. He walks back into the trio trying to kill him. This is what's so insane about his playstyle. BDS should be saving their Jax, but Mickey's positioning is way too ridiculous. He's so out of position that there's no way you ignore him here when he's basically handing over a free kill. But Except you do. You have to, right? If... If worst comes to worst, for Mickey, he dies and Jax dies, he's super happy about it. Especially with this team comp, right? You notice that there's Tristana and Zeri here. This is a double AD comp, and this is what they have issues with. You have too many people that have to kite back and not enough zone control on your team. You tend to see it with triple tank in a... In a um, battle like this because otherwise champions like nautilus just continue walking at you and there's nothing you can do about it we see that lebrov and Sheo are are moving up they're doing fine to do this but like this moving up needs to result in a, a shift to the left to help prevent the jacks from getting out Mickey was facing just far enough out. away to where he could buffer away from Maokai's snare with his hook. At this point, he's baited and wasted so much of their time that Maokai slams his ultimate, presumably... This is awful. Right, th this is just a huge blunder. This is them not realizing that the fight has already started moving down in this direction. This Maokai ultimate should be coming back, and in fact... It's not too late for BDS to come back and win this fight because of how far out Mickey is. Now, you are still down some cooldowns. You're about two, four seconds away from your carries getting some of their spells back. If this R were coming back down this way, then we'd have a much different conversation. But again, it, it, it's a testament to the idea that I have overloaded their mental stack and there's not enough time for them to realize what they can do. Sheo is still thinking that there's people in this area. And there's just not. It's just the Nautilus. Out of tilt. But it's far too late and not going to work. With all the time that he bought, G2 managed to catch up to Jax and kill him while the rest of BDS was distracted. With the enemy top laner dead, G2 now has a 5v4 advantage in this team fight, which they used to eventually win out in the end, solidifying their control over the game. These types of plays are only possible because Mickey understands his own limits so well. He keeps track of where most damage threats are in the map, which lets him know when he can walk safely into the jungle. And when the one damage threat that was there does pop up, he doesn't greed his flash. Most players take half their health for free and damage before flashing away, but he knows he's already wasted some of their time and cooldown, Fantastic. so he instantly flashes so he stays at full HP. And keeping his health high lets him go in for round two, which he can mostly do because of his perfect spacing and champion mechanics. Before you go thinking you could never make a play like that, keep in mind he only has to play this perfectly because he's versus a professional team. Think about all the chaos you could cause in a solo queue game, even with just a bit of aggressive posturing. And to be clear, this isn't a one-off play. Mickey constantly gives G2 game-winning advantages with his positioning. Let's watch one final example. In this next game versus BDS again, he's laning in bot versus Zeri and Lulu. After pushing the wave, the enemy duo move in to contest his control ward in the tribe rush. Keep in mind that as he approaches to defend the ward, G2 very clearly see Kai'Sa and Ivern in the jungle. If a fight were to break out, they would be here first. Caps and Yike are lagging behind and would arrive slightly later. Knowing this, Mickey decides to throw his Q. He misses which actually makes this next part even worse he keeps walking towards lulu which one look how good this is though right like the risk that you're presenting this is such little risk for brahm if the enemy team wants to come up the cost that they're paying is these three casters kogma's not getting the gold for them but he is going to get the experience as the turret finishes them off they also are getting about four auto attacks off maybe six auto attacks off on the kogma so there is a little bit to that but brahm's going to be protecting that he has the ability to jump back whenever if this rotation does come over a it's just for brahm b brahm has the tools to probably get away from this anyways that's the most important thing to realize like hey hey like want to fight want to fight let's go fight i've got this big shield i can tank up so much of your damage and if you do now come these two players don't have a way out also think about what lebrov and crowny are thinking they're moving into this area what's their instincts what would be your instinct if I, if a fight if a problem came out where would i go right 99 percent of you would go this way just reflexively i came in i know it's safe i can get out if you exit that way then what's going to happen to the ivern and the kaisa they don't have that same escape they would have to use flashes to get out 
right? Now your team would have four people pinching on two. So BDS, their correct response here is actually to take all four people to fight through Mickey and Hansama and to come down together and to move this way or to hold this line and let everyone come in before you decide to move out together. No matter what though, you have to do it together. Otherwise you're getting sandwiched and you have to make sure that this these two are able to continue moving out. Once again, breaks every fundamental rule of the game. Kogma is not in range to auto either Zeri or Lulu. Meanwhile, both of them are in perfect position to keep auto attacking Braum. This is parallel positioning 101, which every good bot laner follows. Not only that, even Okay, well, this is, again, not as bad as they're suggesting because Kogma has the attack range that he can handle with this. When he turns his W on, this is totally fine in range. If you're, if you're not, then you only get the one target. In general, what they're talking about is you don't want to be in a position where both of them can hit you, whereas your team cannot both threaten the Zeri. Right now, Zeri is fairly free of threat, but Braum is as well. He's fine to be standing up here. Kogma also not being threatened. They can uh, unleash as much damage as they want while they wait for this rotation to happen. With his ultimate, Lulu never dies. She still has Flash and her own ult. It just makes no sense to play this aggressively here, but Mickey... This R right here could be better aimed, right? You come across, make it a little bit more difficult for the Zeri. That I think they actually lose vision, so that's why Braum has to step up to try to keep vision Doesn't here. Care. Finally, like we mentioned, Kaiza and Ivern got here first, so overextending like this is just asking for trouble. Do you see how in the moment what he's doing seems completely insane? If you ask anyone good, they'll instinctively tell you that he's... All right, so let's slow it down for a moment and let's come up with the perfect play. You know that you've got 4v2. Braum has used all of his resources except for his W. Ka Kogma has stepped up to try to deal some extra damage to Crowny here. So what would be the best answer? All right, we'll do another, another uh, call out. Full aggression, 100% full aggression. You know that you have a five minute, a five second window before the enemy team comes in. Zeri should be eating over this wall, casting her ultimate. Lulu should be ultimate on top of Zeri. Get the knockups. Ivern hits the Q. Uh, Kaisa gets to blast in, and you get to rip through the Kogma first, then the Braum, and then you exit stage right. So we shouldn't say that this play is without risk. This overstep by Kogma is the first big problem. Good positioning by Brown by Crowny to stay uh, close to this wall so they can continue hitting, and also buying some time. This, for a moment, goes a little bit too far. And the question is, do they have the mental capacity to realize it in that quarter second that you have stepped up that one pixel too far? You've gone one champion model too far. This is it. This is punishable. All right. With the with the R down, you no longer have the tools to beat this. You pro I assume that they still have flash. They're not showing this. But Zeri 100% comes in here with her E over the wall. Cast your ultimate, Lulu ultimate on top. That will, by proxy deflect all of the attention off of her, put it onto Zeri, this team will have to retreat, and you're either getting kills or getting nothing, none of you are dying, and your whole team gets, gets to exit stage but just right. like before, Mickey knows his limits all too well. These four champions have very little burst or follow-up this early into the game. He knew that the second that he's collapsed on, he could double This is an unambitious angle right here by Zeri. The That's the huge mistake. That E needs to be right into the back. This Ivern Q coming his way, he stays calm and even sneaks in an auto attack on Kaiza before flashing away. Once again, he set up the... And you can see the position of Kogma right there. Because the Zeri didn't actually threaten, Kogma got to continue hitting. Uh, got to continue hitting. Zeri was not actually a threat. Kaisa tries to jump in and now Nuke is getting hit. Perfect team fight for G2. Every spell... Was and now all the spells are on cooldown. Perfect situation for Yike and Caps to take Let's everyone out. On Mickey, BDS has overextended, so Caps and Yike swoop in and clean up everything. To wrap things up, Mickey's in-your-face playstyle is a big reason why G2's games are often so one-sided. He's constantly bluffing for lane advantages, causing chaos by forcing uncoordinated team fights, and baiting enemy teams to willingly walk into terrible fights. Needless to say, he's a big reason why playing versus G2 is such an uphill battle. He makes you question every single one of your decisions. Is he actually making a mistake, or is he using his positioning to bait you into a terrible situation? Having to answer this difficult question every game versus Mickey makes it a nightmare to play against him. Anyway. That's all for now. Thank all right. And this is why people strung him out so much after, uh, what was it, two years ago? People were willing to say, like, oh, he's washed. He's playing like shit. Everything about him is bad. Guy had an injury. And when you're playing this limit, you don't want 5% of your brain thinking about whether or not your wrist can hold up to the actions that you're doing. Or even you might actually be weaker. You don't want to be thinking about how much 
influence your injury is going to have on your play and that little five percent dip is enough to make mistakes that the enemy team can capitalize and as we can see here there are moments there are moments where there is a best optimal play but is a team willing and able to actually figure that out dissect the information and actually diagnose and make the right play to take advantage of it so that's uh that's the video i thought it was really well done i really wanted to give a highlight you know shout out to skill captain lolly sports for putting that together and the animations were fantastic and now we're going to try to do it mm -hmm.